Uh, one thing you don't know regarding HIV is it's just a test. So you don't need written permission. It's like a full blood count, a liver function test using these. It's literally just another test to throw in the mix. They wouldn't be worried about saying to someone, oh, we need to test you for TB. Just don't make an issue of it. I need to test you for TB. We're going to check your liver, test you for HIV and syphilis. We'll do a chest x-ray. Does that sound okay? Yeah, fine, we'll do that. Okay, there you go. That's how you get permission to do a test. It's very simple. Don't make it an issue. Our guest today on how you should ask permission for a HIV test. Welcome to the Geeky Medics podcast. Hello and welcome to the Geeky Medics podcast and a happy new year. My name is Josh and this podcast selfishly gives me an excellent excuse to interview interesting doctors and healthcare professionals from a range of different backgrounds. If you're anything like me, knowing what you want to specialise in can be really tough. And with our guests, we drill down into why they chose the speciality they're in and what it's really like to do the job. If you're interested in sexual health and HIV medicine, this is your episode. Today, we have the privilege of talking to a consultant on what an interesting job it is. I hope you enjoy. So my name's uh, Brett Palmer. Uh, or do you want to say, do you want to say Dr. Brett Palmer? Oh, I don't mind. Uh, uh, how, how do they how do they usually uh, introduce themselves? Oh, it, it depends on the specialty. I say mm, it d- depends on the seriousness of the doctor. So. <laughs> All right. In that case, then yeah, my name's uh, Brett Palmer. I'm a consultant in sexual health and HIV medicine, uh, and that used to be called uh, genital urinary medicine. But it's exactly the same thing. And uh, I currently work at the RUH, uh, but sexual health is usually slightly separated. So I actually work in an outpatient's clinic, uh, about 20 minutes walk from the uh, the main uh, hospital. Mm, and that's in Bath, the RUH in Bath, isn't it? Uh, Bath, yeah, yeah, Bath in uh, uh, North East Somerset, yeah. So, um, what what have you been up to this week? What what you've been up to today? Uh, before we I've dragged you away from a clinic, I'm sure. No, 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 not at the moment, no. So they, they actually, it's five o'clock and the clinic's actually uh, closed. So I'm just, uh, uh, I'm here uh, on, on my own at the moment. Uh, so what normally happens uh, in my uh, normal standard week is I have uh, various clinics uh, to run. Uh, so in uh, general, uh, uh, general gum clinics, which is basically dealing with uh, general sexual health. Uh, usually, as I'm the consultant, the more complex uh, stuff as opposed to simple stuff uh, as seen by either the junior doctors um, and some of the nursing staff. Uh, could also uh, comp- contraception, uh, and obviously I've had uh, a couple of HIV clinics uh, this week as well. And there's also uh, the administration that goes to that, whether it be uh, letters, uh, um, uh, scripts for HIV medicine, et cetera, et cetera, uh, reviewing uh, results and all that kinds of stuff. So the, the the people I've met who have wanted to do um, to do sexual health as a as a specialty uh, tell me it's, it's reasonably com- it's reasonably competitive to get in now is that is that a fair is that a fair statement is it is it quite difficult to get into sexual health it seems quite a popular specialty although uh, niche. well the problem is it it changed as you know in two thousand and twelve I believe it was uh, you had uh, a lot of changes in uh, medicine and public health and sexual health and HIV medicine were taken out of the uh, guise of, of the NHS uh, and so public health is actually commissioned by the local authorities. And the reason why I'm telling you that is because public health in turn commissions sexual health services. Okay. Uh, And so while uh, the public health team commissions sexual health services, I'm still paid by my uh, local trust in the NHS. But it's not always like that. So in Bristol, for example, sexual health services um, uh, and general girl and contraception services are done by a private company and everything HIV is done by then uh, a separate NHS service. Uh, And so when that change came, before that change, uh, GUM, 
and HIV medicine was highly competitive. Uh, when that change happened, a lot of people decided, I don't want to be at the whim of uh, uh, local authority tenders. Uh, and so when I uh, got around to applying for sexual health, uh, I could effectively pick where I wanted to go in the country. Uh, because there was a shortage of uh, registrars going into the specialty. And there, to my knowledge, there's still a shortage of registrars going into the specialty. Uh, but uh, I don't want to get too political here, but it seems like uh, the political cycle has come to an end and this government will leave uh, over the next one or two years. And so probably the next government will probably bring in uh, sexual health and possibly public health back into the NHS. Uh, and so uh, I would expect uh, people to uh, pick up rates. But also the nature of the job has actually changed considerably uh, in the 12 years we've had this current uh, uh, government mm -hmm. as well. I so I suppose it might be worth going back to to where you where you trained and and sort of your path into into sort of becoming a consultant. Yeah, um, well that's okay. Let me tell you right right back then. Uh, this is you know, old man reminiscing now. Um, so when I was sixteen, uh, I left school with four GCSEs at C grade. I am not doctor material. Uh, not by a long shot. Uh, and that was that. And I was all like, God, if, if someone said to me when I was 17, oh, you're going to become a doctor, uh, I'd have laughed. And so would my, everyone would have laughed. I don't be ridiculous, you know. Um, but uh, over time, um, in my mid-20s, uh, I took myself to night school and studied quite hard. Uh, that got me into Leeds University to study chemistry. And I left with a, a master's in chemistry at 2-1. And then that gave me the qualifications to study for the entrance exams into medical school. After medical school, F, uh, foundation years, which was then two years, core medical training then, which was two years. And then after that, I was a little bit disenfranchised with hospital medicine. Uh, and I was also a little bit, although I was interested in sexual health then, I was a little bit semi-traumatized because two, of, two close friends at the time died of AIDS, I knew. Uh, and I thought, cool. Uh, and so... Uh, you know, I couldn't go into sexual health then. I'd have been, um, <laughs> patients would be counselling me every time I gave a <laughs> HIV diagnosis. Uh, and actually ended up doing public health. Um, and uh, I did public health for five years. I CCT'd in public health, but I, I didn't like the idea of working in a local authority. Um, and uh, after CCTing in public health, I took a step back uh, and then uh, the day after I CCT, I was a, effectively a registrar in sexual health. Did the run-through program in sexual health, um, and uh, yeah, became a consultant uh, when I was at Reading, and then I'm now over at Bath. So a convoluted, a convoluted, a route, convoluted so. route. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't have to be that complicated. It really doesn't. It's uh, you know, but yeah, very complicated uh, route, unfortunately. So, I mean, would it, I suppose it would be the easy answer to say that, you know, having friends who had HIV and, and died of HIV sort of pushed you into the, into the specialty? Is that, would that be a fair statement or have you always sort of been interested in, in it? Well, I've always been interested in sexual health, even before <clears throat> anything like that uh, happened. But I suppose it's a question of, you know, I suppose you've spoken to oncologists about their career. And I, I don't think anyone who's had no experience of oncology goes into oncology unless they've had a loved one or personal experience of some kind of cancer. Mm. Uh, and then that's what, OK, I can do better than this or I can make a change. And then they, that's all the oncologists I've met. They've all got a story behind them. Um, uh, admittedly, not everyone in sexual health has a story behind them, but a lot do. Um, I suppose that's to, it's together with a lot of um, specialties. Um, did it push me towards sexual health? Well, to a certain extent, that experience pushed me away from sexual health. That's why I went into public health. Yeah. I thought I could make a, a bigger difference. But the way public health is set up, I wasn't particularly happy with. And don't get me wrong, I love public health. I think it is uh, a fantastic specialty. But for me personally, I'm a bit of a more hands-on kind of guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I needed that, uh, I, I needed that medical Patient experience. Patient-facing. Type. Exactly. Yeah. But I, I, yeah. And I wanted to do both to run uh, uh, in parallel and I, 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 I couldn't get that set up. Uh, and so it was much uh, better for me to, to leave public health. I still do public health. In, in, if, if you're in sexual health, you do a lot of public health on a day to day basis. Yeah. 
Uh, so that's uh, so to a certain using extent, that training that you have exactly you know, yeah 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 we do we do uh, patient contact tracing and uh, uh, we obviously need to try and uh, we, we collect data to try and stop the spread of disease and we uh, do lots of other bits and pieces to try we do vaccination clinics and we, so we do lots of on the ground um, uh, sexual health with monkeypox that has been and gone and so we uh, in sexual health it was the sexual health doctors that set up monkeypox clinics uh, we stopped uh, patients from going into hospital a lot of the time we set, set up virtual wards and then with the help of our public health colleagues we set up vaccination clinics for smallpox now in the uk and so yeah, if you need a smallpox vaccine if you're at risk of monkeypox you go to a sexual health clinic now right so it's always, yeah always developing always developing yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. and so i suppose um we've sort of talked about your average week but i mean i What's what's the best bit about your job? What do you enjoy the most? I'll be honest with you. Well, uh, it doesn't sound wrong the way I'm going to say it, but I, I do like the stories uh, the patients uh, a lot of the time come out with. The vast majority of patients uh, that come to us are, unlike any other specialty, are, do tend to be enjoying themselves when they're getting their infection, <laughs> uh, which is a horrible way of looking at it. But it it kind of it can lighten the mood, and that's that's a good thing because there is a lot of um, uh, it, it's nice to have a chat. And it's, if if you like uh, 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 stories and conversations, and you've got an open mind and a non-judgmental attitude, then it's uh, a lovely special to be in, without a doubt. And it's uh, and, and that's great here, just hearing people's uh, stories and personal journeys. That's that's a good part of the um, uh, uh, that's a good part of the uh, uh, my specialty, and I like it very much. And the worst part? Yeah. The worst part is when it's not people's choices. Okay, that's the sexual assaults uh, and other kinds of uh, abuse. Uh, those uh, uh, are difficult stories to listen to, uh, and they're very very hard. Uh, but you could argue that's where you actually make most impact as well. I mean, yeah. you're trying to turn uh, people's lives around after they've been assaulted or abused. Um, and so it's that's the hardest. So emotionally, it's very, very hard for the doctors and nurses involved. And uh, a lot of the, uh, and it's not just doctors as well, it's also the nurses. You, you work as a team. And it's a very, very flat structure in sexual health uh, generally. Um, and uh, yeah, but... That, that's the hard bit, without a doubt. That's the hard yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. So moving, moving on slightly, um, and you, you sort of alluded to it before about sort of monkeypox uh, and HIV. I mean, yeah. Some aspects of sexual health have a, a stigma attached to it, not necessarily yes. by sexual health doctors, usually by no. the general public, by media and things like that. How do you, yeah. how do you get over that? How do you... I mean, you know, people, I, I, I suppose I, patients come in with that already, that stigma around, you know, attached to them. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, we've, had, we've had patients phone up to say, we don't want to walk into that clinic. Can we be seen somewhere else, please? Yeah. yeah. And it's like, well, we don't have any satellite clinics, so you, you have to come in or not come in really to a certain extent. Uh, and that makes it a little bit difficult. Uh, in, in terms of personally, uh, when I say to people, uh, you know, I'm, if I'm at a gathering or a meeting and people say, what do you do? Oh, I, I tend to say I'm, I'm a doctor. And that they, it always comes to the question of what sort of doctor are you? And I say, well, this will either uh, start a conversation or kill it stone dead. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. say, I'm a sexual health, I'm a sexual health doctor. Uh, and then and, and, it, and it either the subject changes very, very quickly to something else. Uh, and that is, is a question of don't take it personally because that's the other person's problem. If the other person's not comfortable talking about sex, that's their problem. That's not my problem. Um, and that's, uh, but that's the same with, with everything in life to a certain extent. Uh, but, you know, uh, more than probably seven times out of ten, uh, people go, oh, that's interesting. Uh, and they want to know a lot more. Uh, but three times out of ten, this is all made up figures, obviously. Uh, yeah. People are very much all oh, right. I don't want to know about that. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah, move um, different conversation. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, uh, the reason in the media why it's uh, not 
uh, or is looked down upon. You know, you've got the sexy specialties. I mean, say so people go into them purely because they're sexual, uh, sexy specialties. That's like cardiology. There's a lot of QDOS. Oh, he's a cardiothoracic transplant surgeon. Yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah, even yeah, I was like, surgeon, I'm, yeah. I'm in noise. I'm like, oh, wow. You know, I've, I've done the cardiology <laughs> rotation. It's plumbing, basically, you know. Um, and they say that to me as well. Um, but it, there is a lot of kudos with it, and I, I, I admit that, and also with like neurosurgery and all this kind of stuff. In yeah, sexual yeah. health, it, 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 you don't have kudos without a doubt. Uh, but that is probably more to do with society and our culture's uh, stigmatization of sex um, and sexually transmitted infections. Uh, you know, uh, when you think about it, you, on the media, there's always a, a discussion regarding either trans rights or uh, whether people are bisexual, pansexual, or this or the other, or how people identify. Really, it should really be a non-issue when you think about it. Yeah, yeah. It, doesn't, it shouldn't really matter any way, shape or form. Who cares? You know, who cares who you identify with? Why is it an issue? But it, it is because our culture hasn't quite accepted um that people should be allowed to make these decisions take america uh, america is um uh, just uh, reversed a lot of uh, abortion rights uh, in many many states and um, now it would be un hopefully unthinkable in many parts of uh, europe uh, but to us it's kind of like a non-issue it's like christ what's the matter with the americans yeah. uh, but because there's so much stigmatization about sex and choice around sex uh, that's what causes, in turn, the stigmatization of people who work in, for example, sexual health clinics. Um, in much the same way in America, where we, in, and that's an important thing to say, a lot of uh, doctors think we do abortions in uh, sexual health clinics. We don't. Okay, that's something else. That's the pregnancy, uh, other pregnancy advisory services that do that. And we don't do, we signpost to abortion clinics if needed um, or to other services if needed, but we don't do uh, abortions there. But I'm, I'm sure there would be uh, an even greater intake of breath as a party if you say, oh, work at an abortion clinic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's even yeah. more stigma uh, to that, for example. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. I don't know. Yeah, Was no, de I mean, definitely. Yeah. I, I suppose, yeah. what do you think the... I, I mean, I, so It's a Sin, the programme on, on um, Channel 4, it sort of... Yeah. The, if we go back to, like, HIV when it was first a, a pandemic has huge stigma attached to it and it really you know it, it doesn't particularly i think amongst mm. younger people people don't it's not really you know the stigma has changed isn't it and it's, what do you think the importance of programs like it's a sin and to to uh, you know tackling that type of stigma is i, I think it's very very it. good yeah yeah, no, I've seen it. I've seen it, and uh, uh, it was uh, uh, in some places. I thought it was very, uh, very good and very. Yep, that's what it was like. And other places, I think, God, that's upsetting because uh, yeah. it was upsetting. You know, oh, people, yeah, I cried. Yeah. People, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Uh, there's there's two two things about it. So one, the older generation uh, really identified and went, yes, that's what it was like. Bloody terrifying growing up in secondary school thinking, well, you can't have sex because not that I had sex at secondary school, uh, but it was, it was, it was a, a tough, you know, don't die of ignorance, tombstones falling over. And yeah. it made a lot of people paranoid about sex. And you, and you can see the sexual behaviors in certain age groups are different because of it. Uh, even now, uh, and because of that, I had a, a very long uh, hangover because, but the, the younger age groups and their teenage years now or the early 20s some of them oh it wasn't like that it's just all dramatized you know some of them just don't believe it of course i wouldn't do that you know leave people on the wall to die alone uh, yes that's exactly what they did you know because yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. people were terrified people were scared but i think now we've gone through covid and they've seen how people behave yeah, in yeah. terms of that's mass panic with that people go oh okay yeah that probably is more believable yeah. Uh, with, yeah. with HIV because they've they've lived the COVID experience to a certain extent, mm. um, uh, but it uh, it's good to highlight it. But I think the people who watched It's a Sin are more open to watch a program about uh, you know gay guys and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So there's still there's still a lot of people which 
didn't watch it but should have watched it uh, yeah. because most of most of HIV diagnoses are late diagnoses. Mm. These are people that have had HIV for many many years, and it's yep. uh, you know it's is trying to get to the people which probably mm. don't watch It's a Sin yep. uh, and think that HIV has got nothing to do with them, which is the people you want to reach out to mm. and ask to get tested. Uh, and uh, in terms of, you know, there's lots of new developments. There's yeah. uh, something called pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, there's uh, all sorts of new treatments coming out. And in the um, uh, men who are sex with men community, or the the gay community, uh, HIV diagnoses are going down. You know, we're we're cracking that nut. Mm. Uh, but in terms of the straight community, um, it's not really decreasing at the same rate as the. And so the gay community was definitely overrepresented in any way. But mm. the straight community, um, you know, HIV is a straight person's disease. If you look at it worldwide, the vast majority of people with HIV are straight. They're not gay. And even in the UK, two thirds of people uh, are straight uh, who yeah. have HIV. So everyone thinks it's a gay disease. Yeah, 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 everyone yeah. thinks it's, yeah. that's, that's one of the myths. Uh, you know, everyone thinks, oh, HIV, it's a gay disease. Actually, it's not. It's a straight person's disease. Gay people, or the gay population, are overrepresented yeah. uh, with HIV, um, without a doubt. Uh, but in terms of sheer numbers, uh, one third of, uh, of HIV patients identify as uh, gay or have had men who have sex with men. Um, and two thirds are uh, uh, non, sorry, are non-gay, uh, straight, identify as straight individuals, uh, regardless of their ethnicity. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and a lot of people are a little bit surprised when they hear that. And it's mm. that group that's two-thirds where the new diagnosis aren't really it, it is reducing a little bit uh, but not as reducing as quickly as we want which is uh, a little bit upsetting yeah. in my opinion yeah yeah definitely I suppose um, uh, if you if you think it's just a disease that only men who have sex with men get you're not gonna even you know consider that yeah. um, and yeah. the, the divorce rate so if you look at um, uh, uh, men in their 50s who have just come out of a long relationship that don't know anything about uh, much of in terms of sexual health, in terms of how it's changed in the last uh, 20, 30 years, because why would they? Uh, and then they're all of a sudden they're single. Uh, they go off on holiday to Thailand because they've heard it's you can have a bit of fun over there. Uh, and then they come back with yeah. HIV because no one's told them about PrEP. No one's really told them about condom use because that's not something they you do um uh, and it's uh, and a lot and a lot do come back with hiv and it's uh it's annoying <laughs> more, more than anything but uh, yeah but uh, th th there's lots of other clinics around uh, the country that are doing fantastic work uh, uh in terms of reducing hiv and so while uh, in in bath it's a mainly uh, uh, white population uh, and uh, hiv here the biggest risk is um uh, uh, gay guys, basically, or men who are sex with men. If you go to uh, a previous clinic I worked in at Reading, for example, um, actually, uh, men who are sex with men don't have the biggest risk there. It's actually uh, black African women who have the biggest risk of uh, HIV in that population. So where are the health messages there? You know, uh, and they, uh, and so it's then it's a question of public health bodies trying to push that health message. But I know in Croydon in South London, they've done terrific work in that clinic in terms of trying to get uh, 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 non white females uh, to use pre exposure prophylaxis because obviously there's lots of people, uh, there's lots of population movements uh, from the various countries in Africa, South America and the Caribbean, all moving in and out of uh, Croydon. And so the risk of HIV is actually quite high there. And that's in the straight community. And so it's very important to trying to get um, uh, especially um, uh, black single women onto pre-exposure prophylaxis to try and prevent them contracting um, HIV. Yeah, um, yeah. So it goes back to your public yeah. health Oh yeah, this, all, yeah, this, and this is yeah. no, exactly, and and to a certain extent, uh, doing public health and then coming into sexual health has been very handy. Uh, it's been very very uh, useful. Yeah. 
I know something you talk about um, quite regularly is U equals U. Do, do you think the general population know what that means? So, I mean, U equals U, which is uh, undetectable, means untransmissible. Uh, and that's a very, very important concept uh, to go over uh, to the general public and also to patients. Yeah. It's also a method of reducing um, HIV stigma, which is very, very high out there. Um, and obviously, if someone is HIV positive, they're taking their medication and they're undetectable, it is impossible to pass on their HIV. So if you don't have any virus in your uh blood because it's been suppressed by the medication or well, if you don't have it in your body you can't pass it on it's as simple as that and that's why it's uh, it's a very important message to get across um, and uh, th there is a lot of work done in some communities about you equals you but i don't think it's uh, as commonly known even in the medical profession yeah i was, was going to say I think, yeah, yeah. I, I think there's even there's still like there's Although I think we know that U equals U, you know, right, it, it, there's still, yeah. you, you kind of still feel like you, there is, you know, I don't think we quite appreciate that uh, as a concept <laughs> as much as we perhaps should. And if we're, if we're struggling to, to do that, then, you know, someone with no medical background at all, I imagine yeah. would also struggle with that. I've actually got a grand round on next uh, Monday and I'm going to do it as a quiz base. And one of the questions will be, what is you equals you to see about to see if the hospital consultants and doctors in a grand round, see how many of them actually know what it stands for. And yeah. so that would be quite an interesting uh, <laughs> result. <Yeah. laughs> sort good. of off, off what we were talking about there, uh, certain some of the more and I don't want to call them a difficult conversation but they're, they're tricky topics to um, bring up with patients sometimes um, and I think in a way uh, it's more tricky for you as a clinician as it is for the patient I mean sometimes they don't really care that you're bringing these things up and you're making a big deal when it's not really a big deal but I, I, I wondered if you had any tips for or, or just sort of ways of approaching these things with patients if you do it every day obviously and I suppose it's different for you because they're there with that they're already expecting to have that conversation but sometimes you need to bring these things up with them and it's difficult yeah and i think for that it's very much a question of uh the more uncomfortable the doctor feels the more painful of an experience it will be for the patient yeah so, uh, and you know, if if a doctor is uncomfortable, so it's, let's just say, if a doctor is uncomfortable with their own sexuality, for example, uh, they're going to find it very, very difficult to talk about uh, being straight, gay, or some other uh, sexuality with a patient. Yeah, and to talk about like, how the hell do I ask this? You know, this this you know, none has come in with uh, 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 all the disease and all the hallmarks of uh, uh, symptomatic HIV, which is what used to be called AIDS. Uh, it's come in with AIDS. Um, and I need to kind of ask her about her past sexual history. But she's, uh, you know, she's a religious woman now. I don't know what she did in the past. She may not want to talk about it. And doctors would become in that situation, which is a very rare situation, admittedly, um, would be find very, very uncomfortable about it. But it is a question of you don't know people's past and it's very important to come to the table with a very non-judgmental open attitude and very important to also realize um, that why people have sex because it's you know uh, it's a necessity yeah uh, no one asks you why you breathe your body just you breathe if you stopped eating you would uh, eventually your body would force you to eat and uh, when you get put in a situation where you can have sex, your rational part of the brain closes off and then you just go for it, okay? And if you have a glass of alcohol as well, uh, it closes off even quicker. Uh, and people, a lot of doctors don't realize that, you know, it, it is a natural thing uh, and you get, uh, and, you're, and people are naturally urged to go and have sex uh, and in the cold life today, they, a lot of people would say, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't have done this or maybe I shouldn't have done that. And that's where the stigmatization comes through in our culture and in our profession, because doctors have to behave in certain ways, for example. Uh, and so uh, a lot of doctors are also very um, uh, cosseted. They don't really have uh, 
uh, they've studied a lot, let's put it like that. They haven't gone out and done that much partying. It's very uh, polite, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, 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 yeah, and they're not necessarily as worldly wise and experienced as some of their patients would be. And so it's very difficult when you're coming from uh, an area of inexperience to try and talk to someone who's bound to be more experienced than you to talk about their sex life. Mm. But be open, be honest, uh, and ask uh, straight questions. And it's, it is harder to do it in the GP land, and it is harder to do it in hospital, because um, you know, people are there for, for example, a lung infection. They don't have, have they haven't added together that a suppressed immune system has caused this lung infection. But the job of the doctor is to try and join up and come up with a unifying diagnosis. Um, but don't be frightened of it. You know, uh, HIV is just an infection like any uh, other infection. Um, and yes, it causes problems, but then again, so does many other infections. Uh, and just uh, uh, ask away. Yeah. Uh, one thing you don't know regarding HIV is it's just a test. So you don't need written permission. It's like a full blood count, a liver function test, using these. Yeah. It's literally just another test to throw in the mix. They wouldn't be worried about saying to someone, oh, we need to test you for TB. Just don't make an issue of it. I need to mm -hmm. test you for TB. We're going to check your liver, test you for HIV and syphilis. We'll do a chest x-ray. Does that sound okay? Yeah, fine, we'll do that. Okay, there you go. Yeah. That's how you get permission to do a test. It's very simple. Don't yeah. make it an issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which I've seen people do. I mean, you know, I mean, that's sort of... Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. People make a meal out of it. Yeah. yeah. And patients <laughs> patients come to hospital. Why do a patient come to hospital? A patient comes to hospital because they want to be diagnosed. Uh, and so, therefore, you need to do a battery of tests in order to diagnose them half the yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You've, I, it, you must kind of have these conversations with patients and you think, I've got quite a cool job. You know, I mean, it, you've sort of... It must be quite nice just to be able to... I mean, it sort of goes back to what you, why you move from public health to, to, to sexual health is, you know, having these conversations with patients is, you know, it's interesting. You're meeting some interesting people. You're talking about things no one else talks about with them, potentially, behind yeah. a closed door. You know, having that trust with the patients, such an, you know, it's interesting dynamic. You, d you do have, um, yes, you, you're quite right. And when people phone up a, a sexual health centre, they kind of know, uh, well, most of them uh, know they're go we're going to be talking about sex. You get the odd patient uh, who gives say, "What are you asking me that for? What are you asking me that for?" And they you know, they realise they're supposed to have been phoning up the dentists uh, <laughs> on the other side of the building or something. But it's um, <clears throat> uh, it, it is a very very interesting dynamic, and it is one of the things I uh, I missed a lot when I was doing uh, public health. But then again, it's a, it's a different specialty, you know. Yeah. Um, and you are also in a very privileged uh, position as well. Uh, and it's important not to uh, to, to lose that uh, trust as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Brett Parnham, thank, thank you very much for joining us on the, on the Geeky Medics podcast. It's been really interesting oh, talking about... Pleasure. Talking about your interesting specialty, I hope I hope um, I hope medical students have a, a slight insight. I didn't really get much of an insight as when I was a medical student. Um, we don't really get an awful lot of exposure, so it's really interesting talking to you. No, it's good fun. I'd say to medical students, come and uh, you know speak to your local sexual health centre. Uh, ask for a, a day here or there if you're interested. Uh, if you're that interested, they might even ask you to come back uh, and, and, and do more work for them or what have you uh, we're always keen for people to to come and I, know, and I know you have a youtube channel as well which i was looking before the interview um <laughs> <laughs> with various different bits i'd say um public engagement in sexual health is that fair is that a fair um uh yeah public engagement it's for actually medical student doctors as well as the general public yeah uh to 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 get more knowledge about areas which they may not yeah get be familiar with yeah Brilliant. So check that That's out. That's it. Thanks yeah. very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks so much to Dr. Palmer for an interesting uh, conversation about HIV and sexual health medicine. If you enjoyed this episode and you want to hear more from us, please consider subscribing through your podcast provider. You can follow Geeky Medics on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. We'd love to hear from you with suggestions on whom you would like to hear from next. 
As always, thanks to the producers of the podcast, Emma Harvey and Lewis Potter.